Father, thank you so much for your word. For your word truly is a light and a lamp. Your word truly is our guidepost and our guideline. Truly, your word is our plumb line, God. We believe it is perfect and it's all we need for joy and for peace and for love and for hope and for truth. God, there is nothing that we need apart from your word. We believe that. So tonight, pour your spirit in, into your word and lead and guide us into truth. Lead and guide us into rebuke. Confront us, God, with the things that we need to be co confronted with, God, and encourage us for the ways that we need to be encouraged, God, and lift us up. As your word says, that if we will humble yourself under your mighty hand, we'll be lifted up in due season. Have your way in us, God. We ask it by the power of your blood. Amen. Amen. First Samuel. The time of the Judges has ended. If you've been here for the last couple of months, we've been going through the book of Judges. The final judge is also the first real prophet. This beginning the next series of the prophecies of Israel. The book of Samuel. Samuel penned a large portion of this book, although it dies at the end, so I was pretty sure he didn't pen it after he died. It was written about 1065, 1055 before Christ. So you're looking at about a thousand years yet till Messiah would come. So when we see all the references to Messiah, it's one of those astonishing things. Wow, this guy truly was a prophet. He got to see into the heart of man. This book contains some of the most amazing characters in the Bible that you'll find. The birth of David, a man after God's own heart. The first king in all of Israel up till now. God uh, wanted his land to be a theocracy. Governed by God, the laws of the Lord, the laws of the Bible, reading and leading the nation. Men didn't want it. Men wanted a king. Men wanted somebody to rule over them. And God is so faithful. He gives us what we ask for, even if it's not good for us. In order to teach us good lessons and bad. And we go from a theocracy to a monarchy. And we'll see the the depths that the nation of Israel sinks into. But there's still so much hope yet in this book to be found. Let's look at the first chapter as we read verse 1. Now there was a certain man in Ramathame Zophim of the mountains of Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, the son of Jeroham, the son of Elu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuf, and Ephraimite. Now, we could spend hours looking at the genealogies and wonder why they're there and why all those names are there, but just keep somewhere in the back of your knower that the genealogies are always listed to remind you that the line goes back from Adam to Christ. And always putting all genealogies together in the end, you will see why he was predicted, as you guys remember from Genesis chapter 3, the, what the scholars call is the Proto-Evangelum, the first prediction of the Savior to come would come from the line of the woman, Mary. And why all these little genealogies, are the first they don't seem to mean a lot, but in deeper study, how they all progress together to prove that Christ is exactly who he was supposed to be, who they said he would be, and who he promised to be. However, we're not going to look at that tonight, maybe another. Verse 2, and he had two wives. The name of one was Hannah, and the name of the other was Penina. Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. Again, please give me your attention. We've looked at this a hundred times. Things in the Bible that you wonder, see, it must be true that men were allowed to have multiple wives because this guy, obviously he's in the Bible, and he had two wives. Please don't ever take the description of what's happening in the day for God allowing it to happen. It's not good to have two wives. It, it usually destroys one of the women, and, and it, it is not what God originally intended. Scripture specifically says it. Um, and you'll see why, what, what's happened to this. Now also keep in mind that it was thought in the day that a woman who had many children was blessed of the Lord, and a woman who was barren was cursed of the Lord. That was what men believed. We we'll often find that sometimes the, the chastening of the Lord, the, the hardest times in our lives. I, I heard a pastor one time say that God's, um, man's disappointments 
are more likely God's appointments. God is good all the time. So this young woman, <coughs> Hannah, she had no children. But her adversary, her sister wife, <laughs> had plenty. And look what she had to go through. Uh, verse 2 again, and he had two wives. The name of one was Hannah, the name of the other was Penina. Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. This man went up from the city yearly to worship and sacrifice to the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. Now, these, you got to remember, these guys were pilgrims. And every year they were supposed to go from their hometown to Shiloh. Right now the tabernacle is in Shiloh. It was yet to be in Jerusalem. And every year during the time of feast, they were supposed to go up. And if you guys, for, for homework you could, or home fun, you could look up all the Psalms in the 130s, 133, 134, 135. All these are what's called the Songs of Ascent. You guys know the songs of ascent? They were the psalms or the songs that the Israelites would sing as they pilgrimaged up to Shiloh or later when the house, was, the house of the Lord was in Jerusalem. You know that song? Those who trust in the Lord. That's a song of ascent. They would sing that as they went. They would clap and they would sing. And that's why the Jews at the time, the Israelites became very famous for their songs. Anyway... Every year he went up to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. Also, the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, the priests of the Lord, were there. Now he adds that in there for I don't know why, because you're going to find out that these weren't the two most wonderful men in the world. Eli had two sons, and pretty much they were dirt. They really weren't the nicest. And... Um, he just wanted us to know. And, and as he starts to paint a picture, as, as, as the picture started to paint, guys, please focus back in with me a second. Don't ever fall in love with the messenger. God can use any ass he wants to speak when God says to speak. And God lifts one man up to reveal his wickedness to the whole generation. Or he keeps one man down so that the seed could be planted in the ground and bloom a great blossoming flower. And you're about to see something so important and to understand so much how God will work despite, not in spite of it. I was at a pastor's conference some years ago and they had a Q&A period. And, and one of the people in the church got up and said, uh, you know, at my new church, they, they just started appointing women pastors, and I know scripture forbids that, and, you know, I, I was thinking about leaving the church, and, and the guy that answered the question was, uh, uh, you guys remember you read that book, Fresh Wind, Fresh Fire? The guy, Jim Simbley, he, he said, you know, I, I never want you to forget. He said, I hope that our church is the most biblical church on the face of the planet. And I really hope, and I, and, I, and I plan for that. But never think that God ever works because of you. He always works in spite of man. Whatever issues you may have, God's grace is greater than them. And to leave a church immediately because they're starting to do some things that you think might not be what your opinion or your thoughts are might not be the wisest thing to do. It very may, may very well be God brought you there to pray for them. To exact the exact change that He wants to do in that church. And if everybody abandons instead of praying for their pastor. You with me? No, that's not to say we're going to appoint any women pastors. I don't believe that is scriptural. However, um, my wife, I, I know for me, I would not never even be anywhere near close to pastor that I am without my wife. I mean, my wife is very much the part of the pastor of this church without being the pastor because she's a woman, but she helps me be the pastor that I am. And you guys know that what I mean by when I say that. No, start no religion over that. He went up yearly to the city, uh, Eli's sons, we, we looked at them. Verse 4, whenever the time came for Elkanah to make an offering, he would give portions to Penina, his wife, and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he would give a double portion, for he loved Hannah. He had his wife, 
Hannah, and he loved that thing to death. But that poor woman just could not get pregnant. And for sure she was cursed of God. It must be. It must be she shouldn't have married the guy. He already had one wife. Oh, she must have felt so bad. And here Penina, man, she keeps having kids. She's spitting out kids. She can't get a break. Oh, what this Hannah must have thought of herself. And I know so many sisters here that they just want to have a baby. And for whatever reason, God has closed their womb. And man, do they... Man, they must have done something wrong. They blame themselves. They, 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 they look at their sins. God's punishing me because I had an abortion. God's punished me because I did this. God's punished me because I... Man, I hope this scripture gives you a little bit of hope. And God's, He knows what's best at each and every season of your life. But Hannah had to give, but to Hannah he would give a double portion, for he loved Hannah, although the Lord had closed her womb. You see that? The Lord closed her womb. And her rival also provoked her severely to make her miserable because the Lord had closed her womb. Get a little glimpse into the situation here. Now, how many of you guys watch that show, uh, Sister Wives? How many of you guys have seen that show, Sister Wives? And me and, and my family are the only one, huh? Wow. Well, you guys, oh, okay, you have. You see the interaction between the wives? Isn't it crazy? And, and even though they're on camera, you still see that. You know what I'm talking about? Listen, I don't know. They could legalize it. They could okay it. It could be written in the Bible. Ain't no way I'm having two wives. No how, no way, no. No. Now, I seen something very interesting that one of those women brought up on that show. Um, and I haven't watched it in two or three seasons. I, I just saw it the other day that it was still on. Because I watched the first season and I was just like, man, this is too sick. But one of the chicks, one of, one of the chicks, one of the ladies said, <laughs> said this. She says, why would it be so bad if I had a second husband? And I thought, the first thing I thought is, that is the most disgusting thing I'd ever heard. And it's like, all of a sudden, it's like, wait a second. So why is it okay for a man to have two wives? But it's not okay. For, you know what I mean? There's this whole mental thing going on there. Well, if one ain't right, then the other one ain't right. But the more you shove it down our throat, the more we'll think it's okay, though. Don't worry. What are you doing? What are you, you want another wife, buddy? <laughs> <laughs> And here, her rival. I, I, I find it interesting the way the Bible was her rival. Her rival. He just, she just tormented her. Oh, did you see my baby bump? Oh, I'm sorry, you don't have one? Or are you just getting fat? What is it? Can you just see that? Just horrible, horrible. I mean, look at the way she... He, the Bible says, and her rival also provoked. That word for provoked is an ongoing repetitive, meaning she didn't stop, man. She hammered her severely to make her miserable. Look how many negatives are there. Her rival provoked severely miserable because the Lord had closed her womb. So severe... So it was year by year when she went up to the house of the Lord that she provoked her. Therefore she wept and did not eat. Now the time of the harvest, I mean the time of the, um, the, the, the pilgrimage was a great time of feasting, a great time of song and dance. It says she was so miserable during this time that even though there was a feast, she wouldn't eat. She would do nothing but cry. I can't say. Now, I, listen, I might be one of those guys that imagine. When I read scripture, I try to imagine all this stuff. So I think, well, did she live in one house and she live in the other? Did she only see her during that time or something? I was like, honey, I'm going to my other wife's house. Or where were you last night? Oh, I was, you know, I was out in the field with the sheep. Or you know, how do you, how did that whole thing go on? I don't know. But apparently when they were in each other's presence, they weren't cool with each other at all. And Penina, she was not a nice lady. Verse 8. Then Elkanah, her husband, said to Hannah, Why do you weep? Why do you not eat? And why is your heart grieved? Am I not better to you than ten sons? I see the table, right? And here's Penina with all her kids all around. And then there's Elkanah, and then there's Hannah. And there's Penina eating and drinking. <laughs> Cheers, you know. <laughs> and the kids running around, jumping on Hannah. <laughs> That's great, nice, my kids. And then he looks and he sees his wife, the one he loves, saying, his, Girl, why are you so sad? Am I not better to you than ten sons? Don't I? 
Now, I don't know if you guys have ever tried to do that, to console your wife with, like, logic. <laughs> Like, that's like the f stupidest thing you can ever say. Baby, what's the matter? Well, now you're in twice as much trouble. Because number one, you should already know. <laughs> and number two, you should already know not to ask. <laughs> you're a caveman. I'm trying to fix it. I aren't I better than ten sons? <laughs> you reminded me I have no sons. <laughs> because you spend every other night at that father girl's house. <laughs> but you know, she did the smart thing. Women that my experience have a tendency in their misery to sequester, to hide, to find themselves tucked away and alone. The time that you should be at church, you're at home weeping and feeling sorry for yourself and crying out. Instead of at the house of God, crying out to God and saying, God, and I trust you and I believe in you. Look, look what she did. It's, I love this. So Hannah arose after they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh. Now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat by the doorpost of the tabernacle of the Lord. Please give me your attention real quick. I, I, I want you to understand this. Please, I'm prefacing this by saying what I'm about to say to you is scriptural and it's honest. Don't think ill of me. Eli was a big fat slob. And he sat on a chair and he leaned back against the doorpost of the tabernacle and he'd sit in there and he had this big giant fat belly. Now you guys are saying, oh, how do you know? That? Listen, please, again, I'm only saying what scripture says about him and later on you'll see how this comes to pass. I would never say this unless scripture said it. He's a big fat slob leaning back on his chair against the doorpost of the, of, of the tabernacle. Quite literally, um, it says tabernacle, but the word actually is palace or temple. So it necessarily wasn't the, the innermost part of God's house, but it was like, yeah, I'm the priest around here. And please keep that in mind as, as time progresses. Verse 16. I'm sorry, verse 10. My eyes have gone bad. And she was in bitterness of soul and prayed to the Lord and wept in anguish. Then she made a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant, remember me and not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a male child, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor shall come upon his head. Now, does anybody remember what that means? No razor shall come upon his head. Anybody? The Nazarite, Joey, excellent job. It's a Nazarite vow. You guys remember, Samson had taken a Nazarite vow that he wouldn't go near a dead body, he wouldn't drink any wine, no razor would come upon his. It was something that was dedicated to the Lord. Now, there was lifetime vows, there was monthly vows. You could make a vow, a Nazarite vow to the Lord for your child. Like I, I've told you guys, Josiah was, was given as a Nazarite vow to God. When he was pregnant in my wife's belly, I would put my hand on and tell, and tell him through the, that he was a Nazarite. And all the days of his life, he would stay away from what is dead. He would never drink. He would never ever. And, 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 uh, and spiritually speaking, he would never cut the hair of his head. He, he would never remove the covering from his head. That the hair signified a covering. That you would never think to yourself high, more high than you ought. That you always have a covering. That's why Jews wear a, a, a yarmulke. To, let, to, to always have a covering. You with me? Good job, Joey. Um, verse 12, and it happened as she continued praying before the Lord that Eli watched her mouth. Now Hannah spoke in her heart, only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore Eli thought she was drunk. <laughs> the picture starting to be clear here. Eli, not the most spiritual pastor in the world. A woman goes into the church and she's crying and she's praying. And she's speaking to God. She's not doing it for a show. She's not doing it to get attention. She's praying and she's... And Eli, fat slob, sitting on the, leaning back, looks at her and goes, What are you, a drunk? Put away your wine! Now, I've only been a pastor for about 10 years now. But I've never said that to anybody. I don't know what this dude's trip is. I don't know where. But let me tell you. 
You could become, now guys, stay with me on this thought. I don't know what church you go to, what church you come from, but a proper pastor is supposed to lovingly rebuke, exhort convincingly, convicting with the Word of God. Yes, there's a time to be confronted, but it's a loving confrontation that makes you ready a, a doctor, not a cop. Like this guy sitting around. Now, they were all at the feast, and I guess he was looking at the sinners. You ever find yourself doing that? Oh, that person's such a sinner. Look at them. People come into your place of business, or you see them at work. Oh, a sinner. Like, it's funny how we could pick out our sins really good on other people. How many of you guys ever go to the airport? Next time you're at the airport, gentlemen, ladies, don't do this. Look at how the men oogle at the women. It's the sickest thing in the world. It's like every time a nice looking woman walks by, every guy in the airport's like, oh man, oh man. <laughs> and you look and I sit there and there I am trying, you know, just doing my best, man. I'm thinking to myself, you bunch of freaking perverts, man. Why don't you relax? It's a woman like every other person in the world is one of them. And then when my head gets turned, now all of a sudden I'm not feeling so judgmental on myself though. <laughs> It's really easy to smell my sin on other people. You understand what I'm saying? Ladies, I know you can relate to this thing. Guys don't want to hear that girl's lust. We never want to hear that. You guys don't lust. My wife never lusts. Only after me. Right? We smell our sin so easy. And here, Eli was such a... Again, scripturally speaking, he was such a drunken, fat slob. I promise it'll come up in scripture. When I read it to you, you'll be like, wow, he was right. Comes up. And here's his poor woman just pouring her heart out to God. Hey! Watch what he says to her. Verse uh, 14. So Eli said to her, how long will you be drunk? Put your wine away from you. But Hannah answered and said, No, my Lord, I am a woman of sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor intoxicating drink, but have poured my soul out before the Lord. Do not consider your maidservant a wicked woman, for out of the abundance of my complaint and grief, I have spoken until now. It's such an important point here. She has a reverence for the office that was the priest without having judgment toward the guy. Now, we don't know if she knew that Eli was an idiot or anything like that, but do you notice how she had reverence toward him anyway? She didn't go, uh, excuse me, I was praying. Nice priest you are. I'm never coming back to this tabernacle. <laughs> and we do that. We go to a church sometimes and a pastor will say something that we don't like. Look at this guy. Like, listen, maybe he had a bad moment. You know, us pastors, we say a lot of stuff. And you know how many times we go home and our wife, I mean, the Holy Spirit says, you know, baby, I wish you wouldn't have said that. I wish you wouldn't have said this. I wish you wouldn't have said that. And, and we go, huh? I didn't think of that. Not me. Just saying. <laughs> she had reverence for the office because God was working. Why? Despite Eli, God was still there. Despite Eli, God was still there. And don't think to your church, when you hear me say stuff about this church or that uh, church by the Glades, Calvary, Fort Lauderdale, any of the giant churches, when you hear me say things about those churches, don't think for a second that I'm intending anything to say God's not there. I'm just saying this, and please write this somewhere down in your brain, that a church is not good because it's big. Some churches are big because they're good. Not all of them. But remember, a church is never good because it's big. That's not the gauge of a church. Well, there's a little church, so God must be there a little bit. And there's a big church. Or that's a really big church, so God doesn't want nothing to do with that church. Not the case. I know. Listen, I know a guy that got saved at Calvary Fort Lauderdale, became a pastor and started his own church. That's me. I know plenty of people here that grew up under that teaching and, and fared quite well. I know some people from uh, Church by the Glades. Now, again, I don't, that's not my style. 
It's not how I'd run a church. But let me tell you something. I know the pastor of that church and he loves Jesus. And he'll have to stand before God and I'll have to stand before God. And how did you run your church? Me, I hope they say, they say, hey bro, you did a great job sticking to this book. Not saying I'd want to be on the back of the line when those guys are in front of me having to answer for the crazy things they did, but you guys are feeling what I'm saying, right? Okay. God was working despite Eli. And Eli answered and said, go in peace and the God of Israel grant your petition which you have asked of him. Now he wants to get all spiritual. I love it. And she said, let your maidservant find favor in your sight. So the woman went her way and ate and her face was no longer sad. I love this. Here you should go. The church was being run, first of all, again, by Eli, not a very spiritual priest, and his two sons who were just completely wicked. They needed to die, and they needed to die quickly. You'll see what I mean when, as the next few chapters come. Here this woman comes. She pours out her heart to the Lord, and something happens. Despite the fact that the men of the church were not walking with the Lord, she received her prayer. Her heart was lifted up. She, unleashed, she relieved her burden at the altar, and God answered her. The Bible says in uh, Proverbs 18.1 that a man who isolates himself seeks his own desire. He rages against all wise judgment. Don't sequester yourself. Don't hide yourself away. When I say, hey ladies, there's a Bible study tomorrow night, and you say, no, I've been hurt before. Well, welcome to life, okay? We've all been hurt. Stop feeling sorry for yourself. There's somebody that needs ministry. And maybe you can help them. Maybe the hurt that you went through, somebody else is going through and they need it. And they need to know there's a sister there who's gone through something. No, but you just go home and feel sorry for yourself. That's what you do. Guys do that all the time. I hate that. Oh, I was hurt. Like, duh, who ain't been hurt? Show of hands. Who has never been hurt? Look around. She went to the church, despite the fact that her rival was there, despite the fact that her kids were there, her rival's kids were there, despite the fact that her husband was being insensitive. Hey, aren't I better than ten sons? Ah! Right to the Lord. Right to the Lord. We didn't judge her for who she was, what she was, what she did. He, he said, I closed your womb. Why did you close my womb? So we could have this time right here. Really? Really? Well, you know, I, I would have probably came to you earlier if you would have opened my womb. No, you wouldn't have. How do you know? I'm God. I know everything. <laughs> so are you saying sometimes God punishes us for our own good? That's exactly what I'm saying. Guys, the, two mis the most misunderstood things in the church, in the church, is prayer and salvation. Even Christians don't know how prayer works. We're praying for these fighters. We're not praying, and if we pray more than the other guy prays, they win. <laughs> That's not the way it works. We're praying that their heart would be right with what God is doing, and if God decides to do something miraculous, hallelujah. We want to be on board with that. If she would have just prayed enough, if she would have just had more faith, her womb would have been open. You know how many churches teach that? If you just have more faith? That is just not scriptural. It's good for business, though, because those churches get lots of people in them, and they give lots of money. As a matter of fact, we're going to do that tonight. Would you get the garbage can? And anybody who I, I, I sense there's somebody with a thousand dollars here, and there's a seat off. You have a thousand dollars in your checking account, don't you? Don't do that. Don't do that. <clears throat> Her face was no longer sad. Hallelujah. Verse 19, Then they rose early in the morning and worshipped before the Lord and returned and came to the house at Ramah. And Elkanah knew his wife. That word for new, it means new. <laughs> Hannah, his wife. And the Lord remembered her. So it came to pass in the process of time that Hannah conceived and bore a son and called his name Samuel. What Samuel mean in the original language? Ask of God. Now why did I ask her? Because her son's name is Samuel, and she named him after the Samuel in the Bible, and I know that I was there. <laughs> because I have asked for him from the Lord. 
Now the man Elkanah and all his house went up to offer the Lord to the yearly sacrifice in his vow, but Hannah did not go up. For she said to her husband, Not until the child is weaned, then I will take him, that he may appear before the Lord and remain there forever. Now I don't know why that's there, because I certainly wouldn't have agreed with that. If I was her husband, I'd be like, Wait a second. Let's get this straight. God gave you a kid. You're going up, and you're going to thank God for that. But she had known something. You know, she had known... I don't know. I, I don't even know how to explain that. But she said, listen, when the kid's weaned, then I'm going up. But I'm not going up until the kid is weaned. Now, I don't know why. Maybe they had a party there. Maybe they had, the, maybe they had somebody watching the kids, and the kid was... They were still nursing. I don't know what the situation was. But they put that in there for a reason, I, and I'm, someday I'm going to figure out why that is. So Elkanah, said, Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Do what seems best to you. Wait until you have weaned him. Only the Lord establish his word. Then the woman stayed and nursed her son until she had weaned him. Now, I like that Elkanah's faith there. Elkanah said, You made a promise to God? And God's word came to pass? Okay, then you wean the child, and when the time is right, we will give him to the Lord. Now, remember something. She made a promise to God that if she did get pregnant, she was going to give this child to serve God all the days of his life. She made that promise to God, and God said, Yes, I hear you. She got pregnant. She has the baby in the first year. As she, right after she has the baby, she goes, I'm not going up there. Now, to the outside world, isn't it so funny how we can be so judgmental? See? She's already, she's already changing her mind. She's already... We, we're smelling other people's sins on us again, aren't we? Verse 24, Now when she had weaned him, she took him up with her through, with three bowls, one ephah of flour, and a skin of wine, which if you look in Scripture, is, a, uh, is some of the, uh, the offering for a male servant. It was kind of signifying that she was really going to do what she had promised to do. Now, guys, can I, I want you to imagine something. Please, imagine the Constitution. Imagine the strong will. Imagine the honor of, of Hannah. Truly, there is a reason that this woman has gone down in history. Now, also, people will um, ask us if we do baptisms. If you're, if you're new to our church, how come you guys don't do baby baptisms? We don't do baptisms. We do dedications. This is the very reason we do dedications. Because Hannah dedicated her child to the Lord and went through with her... She'd been married who knows how many years, but apparently her rival had a whole mess of kids. So apparently she'd been there a while. Imagine, let's, for argument's sake, say she's been there 12 years, 10, 12 years. Her rival's got 10, 12 kids. She has one. But she made a promise to God. I'm going to give him to God. And she's keep going through with it. This is an honorable woman. This is a woman who is... She's, she's, she's one of those Deborah women. She's one of those Ruth women. Isn't it funny? <laughs> women in the Bible, man. Don't look like some sad sack to me. Don't look like some beat up hag to me. She, she looks like a, a woman who is honorable, who is faithful, who heard the voice of God, who obeyed the voice of God. Why does the world think that the women of the Bible are so pathetic? I don't get it. Now when she had weaned him, she took him up with her with three bowls, one ephah of flour, and a skin of wine, and brought him to the house of the Lord in Shiloh. And the child was young. And they slaughtered a bull and brought the child to Eli. And he, she said, O oh my Lord, as your soul lives, my Lord, I am the woman who stood by you here praying to the Lord. For this child I prayed, and the Lord has granted me my petition, which I ask of him. Therefore, I also have lent him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he shall be lent to the Lord. So they worshiped there. She literally did it. I mean, I don't know how old the kid was, two, three, four. I mean, I've seen women nurse till five and six. I mean, I know if that was my only kid, I'd be nursing a long time. But she brought it up there. Remember that baby at Fort Lauderdale? <laughs> oh, my goodness. This woman was nursing this five or six-year-old kid. How much? 48 months. Yeah, right. Now, they don't use, when you're still nursing, they don't use years. They only use months. And there she was, and she lifted up her shirt. Man, bang. We were like, whoa. <laughs> no? That's it? Okay. <laughs> I love the, the next, we're going to read the next few verses, but I want you to see. When she made her offering to the Lord and she fulfilled her promise that God had promised her, she wasn't bummed out. She was blessed. 
look at the poem she wrote to God. And I, I, love, I love people that write poetry to God. It's such a, a great overflow. Listen to this. And Hannah prayed and said, My heart rejoices in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. Now that word for horn literally means power. My strength is exalted in the Lord. I smile at my enemies. I like that. How many kids you got? I got one and I'm happier than you. Right? It's amazing how you see a woman, she's got five, six, seven kids around, running around her. When you have no kids, you're looking at her going, huh, I wish I was her. Now all of a sudden you got one kid and you're like, I don't know how she, why she had that many kids. She can't handle them. <laughs> Ladies, you know what I'm talking about or not? How many kids she got? I smile at my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. No one is holy like the Lord, for there is none beside you, nor is there any rock like our God. Has God ever shown up in the miraculous for you? Has he ever? I mean, you remember the thing he did with Ruth? And we were like, no way did he just do that. Has he ever did one of those no way moments in your, in your life? Like a job, a, a, a uh, softening your boss's heart. He's like, no way he just did that. No way he just did that. And this is how it is, right? No one is holy like the Lord, for there is none besides you, nor is there any rock like our God. Hallelujah, Hallelujah is right. Talk no more so very proudly. Let no arrogance come from your mouth. Who do you think she was talking to? <laughs> In parentheses, we should write in Penina. <laughs> For the Lord is God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. In other words, God's been hearing what you've been saying to me. Don't you worry. And how good is it to know that you don't have to exact justice yourself? God's listening. God's got this. I'm hearing. Don't That boss, that man, that woman, whatever. I, I, I hear. I hear. Verse 4. The bows of the mighty men are broken, and those who stumbled are girded with strength. Those who are full have hired themselves out for bread, and the hungry have ceased to hunger. Even the barren has borne seven, and she who has many children has become feeble. The Lord kills and makes alive. He brings down to the grave and brings up. The Lord makes poor and makes rich. He brings low and lifts up. He raises the poor from the dust. And he lifts the beggar from the ash heap to set them among princes and make them inherit the throne of glory. From the pillars of the earth are the Lord's. And he has set the world upon them. He will guard the feet of his saints. But the wicked shall be silent in darkness. For by strength no man shall prevail. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken in pieces. From the Lord he will thunder against them. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the, the horn of his anointed. And lastly, verse 11, Then Elkanah went to his house at Ramah, but the child ministered to the Lord before Eli the priest. Close your Bible. Just like, just like Ruth, God can show up in the midst of your misery, in the midst of your trouble, when everything... But you don't know how many doctors I've been to. It can't happen. They said no. There is no God like our God. No one is worthy to be worshipped like our rock. He can reach right in and change it. Stay in the house of the Lord. Go up. Worship the Lord. And who cares if somebody thinks you're drunk? Who cares? Who cares if your family thinks you're out of your mind? Who cares? Who cares if your husband doesn't understand your faith? Who cares if your friends don't understand? Who cares? What are you, drunk? You go to church twice a week? You guys out of your mind? I must be. I must be. Because here I am again. Man. Please remember as we go through this book. The book of 1 Samuel is not only a Bible book, it's a history book. And there had never been nobody that's proven anything in this book wrong. As a matter of fact, there are still treasure hunters that look in this book at the kingdoms that have risen and kingdoms that have fallen, and they literally hunt treasure based upon the kingdoms that have risen and fallen in this book. 
1 Samuel is an amazing book. And, and there are apologetic books based upon 1 Samuel that you, will be, you cannot believe the accuracy of the times and the places and the kings and the kingdoms. And everything that this book says about God will come to pass, for He is good all the time. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for your book. Thank you, God, for the, the pictures that you've given us. Thank you for, for Hannah truly. Man, she swore to her own hurt. And when it said that Elkanah went back to his house in Ramah, but left his son. Man, these people had some faith to believe that you were doing something incredible, God. May we have that faith, God. May we have the faith like Hannah and Elkanah. And God, we, we lift before you all our misery, God, and, and, and even as our, the, the lips of our heart move and our mouth speaks nothing, you know the treasures of our heart, for your word tells us that you know what we need even before we ask. God, we pour our complaint before you, as the word says. May our heart make groanings that, that cannot be uttered. Thank you, God, that you understand. I pray for any woman that's here that's carrying pain. May they look to Hannah and Ruth and Naomi as sisters. Bless us, God. Holy Spirit, may you ingrain in them a faith that they didn't have before. We ask this in your name, Jesus. Amen.